Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me along uh, today. I'm a strong believer in uh, individual freedoms. Uh, I continuously battle against the nanny state uh, proposals which uh, come out of the last Labour government and unfortunately uh, occasionally from the current coalition government too. Um, I voted against the introduction of the smoking ban in 2006 on a libertarian principle. I don't smoke. I don't even like going into smoky places. Uh, but that's my choice. Nobody forced me to go into any of those places. And uh, if I own a bar or I own a restaurant, they're my premises. And uh, I believe that uh, I should be able to decide whether or not people smoke on my premises. And it shouldn't be for the government to tell me who, what I can allow people to do or otherwise in my own, on my own premises. Um, I have also speak out regularly against the proposals to introduce minimum pricing of alcohol and the ridiculous display of tobacco products and even more ridiculous proposals to introduce plain packaging of tobacco. The people who were introducing that certainly never worked on a cigarette kiosk in a supermarket like I have where there will be absolute carnage uh, with a display ban and plain packaging which is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, I don't do disagree that alcohol in excess, tobacco in excess, fatty foods in excess are bad for us. Um, but they're for, for us to make our own decisions. We don't need the government to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. We should be free to make those decisions ourselves. Uh, and I was also delighted, as I'm sure most people in this room were, that the government decided to scrap the ID card system, uh, which would have seriously impinged on our individual freedoms. And if I went to the local shop, uh, and uh, there was a crime committed there and uh, the police wanted to know, see my ID card and I didn't have it on me, what was going to happen? Was I going to be arrested? Uh, if I was going to be given 14 days to produce it, it seems to defeat the object of it in the first place. So it was seriously going to impinge on my freedoms and I was pleased that the government scrapped it. Uh, but it will be easy for me this evening to uh, make a speech where we all agree, we all congratulate ourselves. And, uh, uh, but I, I'm also a big believer and a big fan of uh, advocating unpopular causes. So tonight I wanted to um, challenge people uh, somewhat, and, um, and I know I'm going to be in a hostile audience, um, but I, I wanted to give an alternative view about freedom to a certain extent, and, and to encourage you not to have knee-jerk reactions against things that people jump up and down about, but actually don't really infringe on our freedoms, and actually, in my opinion, actually enhance our freedoms. And in the UK, in the name of freedom, is it a bill, a freedom bill that's going through Parliament? The government are going to try and increase the regulation for the police of using CCTV cameras and want to reduce the number of people that are going on the police DNA database. Um, and whilst I'm a keen believer in individual freedom, I also believe that the first duty of any government is to protect the public and certainly to protect the public from crime. And it's for that reason that I actually believe we need more CCTV cameras, not fewer, and more people on the DNA database, not fewer. Now, some people say that increasing CCTV and the DNA database is uh, against their civil liberties. I'm not entirely sure. I've never known really what civil liberties were. It always seemed to be a left-wing phrase, as far as I was concerned. But the definition of civil liberties is that they're given to treat all the people equally under the law and make them enjoy rights of speech protection, enjoyment and liberty. And I want to talk about protection, which seems to be one of the key ingredients of civil liberties. And I believe that one of my key civil liberties, one of my key freedoms, is to be able to go and walk the streets safely without becoming the victim of a serious crime. And I know, I don't just think, I know that the DNA and CCTV are extremely useful crime-fighting measures uh, and help to keep uh, us all safer and make it safer for us to walk down the streets. Now, I want to be clear from the outset, I'm not in favour of councils using CCTV cameras to snoop on whether or not people are recycling the right stuff and putting it in the right bin. Uh, that, to me, is an abuse of CCTV. I'm talking about using CCTV to identify and prosecute criminals and criminal activity. Let's look at the effectiveness of it. A Scotland Yard study into the effectiveness of surveillance cameras revealed that almost every Scotland Yard murder inquiry uses the, that footage as evidence. In 90 murder cases over a one-year period, CCTV was used in 86 investigations. It can help the police pursue the right avenues of inquiry. It can help them rule out the wrong avenues of inquiry. Their head of homicide has said that CCTV plays a huge role in helping us investigate serious crime and I hope people can understand how important it is to our success in catching people who commit murder. 
In many areas, CCTV is watched by live monitoring teams who can call the police in the, to the scene as soon as a crime is witnessed. And unless you had millions of police officers stationed on every street corner, park, road, without CCTVs, these crimes would go unreported and undetected. In fact, the recent case of the crossbow cannibal, which was in, in my constituency, he murdered three prostitutes and, and, and uh, dumped their bodies in my constituency. He was only caught because he, his final crime was, was caught on CCTV in the block of fat flats in which he lives. It was only on the, when the caretaker arrived on Monday morning to look through the weekend's footage that he saw Griffiths brutally murdering a young female with a crossbow before celebrating. He called the police and they immediately arrested him and subsequently charged him with triple murder. Without CCTV, he may well still be out there, free causing other victims of crime. And CCTV is not only a valuable tool for the police, it's an invaluable tool in courts on two levels. Firstly, to convict the perpetrators of crimes and acquit those who have not committed a crime. But it also provides conclusive, unbiased evidence, void of anyone's spin or recollection at the time. And often when CCTV is viewed by defendants and their solicitors, it leads them quickly changing their plea from not guilty to guilty. Uh, and it also means that witnesses don't have to come in and give evidence to crimes when they might be intimidated from doing so. It could also prove that someone has been wrongly committed of a crime, as was the case with Edmund Taylor, who was convicted of dangerous driving. His conviction was quashed on appeal when the CCTV footage showed that a white man was actually driving the car and Mr. Taylor was black. Another useful tool that we should promote is the automatic number plate recognition scheme, which tracks number plates of cars and highlights those that are driving without insurance and those uh, tr charts their progress on the road network. It was only through the automatic number plate recognition team that West Yorkshire Police identified the murderers of WPC Sharon Beshadivsky and her murderers were caught and convicted. And I think that uh, people who are advocating the civil liberties agenda and the government are completely out of touch with public opinion on this particular issue. issue. A Home Office report into public attitudes towards CCTV in 2005 asked people what they thought of the statement that overall the advantages of CCTV outweigh the disadvantages. And 82% of those surveyed either agreed or strongly agreed. And to be perfectly honest, when people come to my street, I've never had somebody who's complained to me about CCTV cameras being down their street. The only complaints I ever get is that CCTV cameras are not down their street. Many opponents using the civil liberties argument uh, to support the case for reducing such technology. But what I don't understand is how footage of somebody walking down the streets in a public place is inv invading anybody's privacy. People choose to walk down the streets, anybody can see what they're doing down the street. It's not about having CCTV cameras in people's bedrooms and people's bathrooms, they're in the public domain. People's actions are already not private. And a similar civil liberties argument is used against the DNA database. But having our details on a DNA database doesn't actually impinge on the freedom of anybody to go about their daily lawful business. It doesn't affect our freedom to do anything at all. In fact, I wanted to put my details on the DNA database. I actually volunteered because I thought if the police were investigating a crime and I could be linked to it, I'd rather they ruled me out using my details on the DNA database rather than having to arrest me and take it and go through all of that rigmarole before they found out that I was innocent. This is enhancing my freedom, it's not uh, affecting it. It's already fairly heavily regulated, the use of DNA, and Lord Justice Leveson, uh, when he had a review of the retention of DNA in the individual courts as a judicial review, he stated that the material stored says nothing about the physical makeup, characteristics or life of the person to whom they belong. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Sure. As a result of um, having the, uh, the government's proposed changes to the people on the DNA database, uh, murderers such as Ronald Castry will be free to roam the streets and potentially kill again. Castry stabbed 11-year-old Leslie Mosseed in 1975 when she was on the way to the shop to buy bread for her mother. Stefan Kishkow was wrongly convicted and jailed for 16 years until, for the murder until 2005 when Castry's DNA was taken after being arrested but not charged over another sexual attack. Those people who think people who have been arrested but not charged should have their details taken off the D D DNA database, that's wrong. 
uh, that they kept should think about Ronald Castry. It can protect witnesses, convict criminals who have been evading capture. Only recently a 50 year old Bradford man who had sex with three of his daughters and impregnated two of them was jailed for 12 years through the use of DNA. I, I think that uh, people who have this belief in civil liberties are making a big mistake by arguing against things like CCTV and DNA. One of the cornerstones of a free society is the rule of law. A belief in freedom is totally compatible in a, with a belief in strong policy on law and order. A belief in freedom should never be confused with a belief in anarchy, which is what some people in practice propose. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Philip Davis, for that um, uh, bracing interpretation of the Civil Liberties Agenda. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, the Absolute Institute for inviting uh, me to speak this afternoon. Um, take up one thing that uh, Mr. Davis has said. The first duty of any government is to protect the public. I would hazard that this is not, in fact, the first duty of this government or any other government. The first duty of any government is to behave in a fit and proper decent fashion while respecting its limits, respecting uh, its uh, inadequacies, and being modest enough to recognize that attempts at straightening the crooked timber of humanity invite more trouble than they're worth and ask more questions than they can possibly answer and ultimately uh, lead us into very dangerous and difficult and depressing places. I think that uh, this is, uh, there are a number of things in Philip's speech that uh, other members of the panel will want to address. But fundamentally, he, he, if you frame the job of government as by protecting the public, then that becomes licensed to permit the government, the, permit the state, anything and everything that it desires, provided those desires are expressed in the means of protecting the public. It's the, if it saves one life, argument uh, uh, and as a result is essentially granting carte blanche to the state to interfere in every single aspect of anybody's life regardless of whether this is necessary, warranted or useful. And useful actually matters as well because I would actually contend that the test of a government policy is not whether it works but whether it is decent. Nobody denies that CCTV and a DNA database can be useful in helping solve crime. Nobody denies that. What people do have a problem with is the presumption that the state has the right to list these details, to follow you around in one sense or another on a daily basis. Uh, the question is not actually what works in, in practice, but what is acceptable in principle. I think we see this in other lifestyle issues, we see it in, uh, in tobacco choices, where the argument became, thanks in part to the failures of big tobacco, uh, the argument became a, some bizarre battle between smokers' rights and non-smokers' rights, when all along it should have been focused on publicans' rights as property owners and businessmen seeking to permit and license activity in their own establishment. We see it in our drug laws, which remain a crazy abhorrence and a desperate infringement of individual liberties all in the name of protecting the public because somehow or other central government and uh, the state payroll uh, of whom Mr. Davis is of course one uh, uh, <laughs> both know better and can be trusted to know better uh, than us. As a, as a consequence we've created a vast network of victimless crimes. There was a, an extraordinary case in, in Edinburgh recently of uh, a poor man uh, whose house had been uh, burgled, housebreaking. Uh, he'd been a victim of housebreaking. Uh, and uh, when he reported this to the police, he made the mistake of confessing that among the things that had been stolen from his house were his collection of cannabis plants. Um, uh, uh, half a dozen or so. Uh, 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 let me say that uh, the gentleman in question uh, is not a testament to the, or, or was not perhaps a standard bearer for the Scottish educational system. Um, nevertheless, uh, 
he was got duly arrested on uh, possession charges of um, uh, having having admitted to possessing cannabis plants. That uh, by his uh, uh, estimation or his defence was that he used them uh, as uh, to pr help provide pain relief from uh, the hepatitis C from which he suffers. Uh, whether this is the case or not, the bigger question is what on earth is this man in prison for? For the crime of possessing plants in his own house, not selling or producing anything to uh, run a business, although why that should be considered criminal is another matter, uh, but purely for his own benefit. In this case it happened to be pain relief, as has been, we see with lots of medical marijuana issues. I would say that pain relief is not enough either. You know, that if we accept that the use of the personal consumption of cannabis and cultivation of cannabis is permissible for pain relief, then we should also accept that it must be permissible for pleasure. That drugs can be a good thing. And that it is your business, not the state's, to determine whether your production and consumption of narcotics is, uh, is or should be treated as, as a matter for the police. Every year in this country, we incarcerate hundreds and thousands of people on drug laws that do not have victims. On drug laws where, the only, where somebody's offence has only been to consume a product for their own pleasure that the state has determined they may not consume for their own pleasure. Uh, as a consequence, well, it, it, is, uh, it is, I suppose, a relief in some ways, that, our drug, that the way we police our drug laws is marginally more sensible than the way they've arranged these matters in the United States. But it is not sufficient uh, to think that just because we're not quite as crazy as our American cousins and friends, uh, we have a clean bill of mental health ourselves on this matter. Because we do not. Uh, I can't think of anything. When he was a backbencher on the Home Affairs Select Committee, David Cameron uh, freely admitted that our drug laws were not fit for purpose, that they were broken, that uh, something had to be done, that uh, the drug war was being lost. Uh, personally, I don't think it actually matters whether it's being won or lost, because what matters is the principle. Too often, I think, we argue about outcomes, and we don't argue about principles sufficiently strongly uh, in the public arena. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it perhaps is time for some friendly backbencher, if we, if we can find one anywhere, to raise this matter with the Prime Minister, perhaps at a forthcoming issue of Prime Minister's questions, and ask him whether or not his views on this and other matters, in which he was once rather more liberty-friendly than seems to be the case now, have changed, or whether he was wrong then, and like everybody else who gets to power, uh, suddenly sees the error of his ways once he's in government, and it becomes too difficult too awkward, too impossible for anyone to actually change uh, uh, our approach to these issues. And instead, everything I knew as a backbencher was wrong, and everything I know in, as a Prime Minister and now that I'm in power is correct. And I know this because the police have told me. And the police, as we all know, uh, are most unlikely to ever insist that they have too many powers, that their responsibilities are uh, too strained, and that they should... Uh, uh, do not require uh, the very things that Mr. Davis has been, uh, been claiming are, are so not vital to maintaining the safety and security of our streets. Uh, if uh, there is a sense in which uh, citing police sources saying, you know, I, I welcome these additional powers to fit people up uh, uh, is in some way a justification for these additional powers. I mean, of course, that is what the police are going to say. Um, I would say then, in, in closing, uh, that we should not be sidetracked by outcomes, we should be arguing from principles, we should be arguing in defence of individual liberties, we should be arguing in defence of property rights, we should be arguing that, uh, that it is up to the individual to determine their own path, it is up to the individual to de determine what is their view of pleasure, and we should remember, above all, that uh, it is perfectly possible to be a consumer of a wide range of presently illegal narcotics and other uh, substances and remain an upstanding and uh, uh, functional member of uh, society. And indeed, there's a parcel of rogues on the banks of the Thames which uh, demonstrates the validity of that argument uh, uh, in as much as uh, uh, there too uh, there are pleasure seekers uh, 
whose crimes now are to seek to criminalise people for pursuing the very pleasures that they once enjoyed themselves and, and doubtless in many cases, continue to do so, uh, which I would say is an un unnecessary and depressing note upon which to conclude. <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw, saw or read the news yesterday, but it was a, a pretty good day for the nanny states in, in various different countries. Um, here in England, October the 1st, saw the, uh, the ban on cigarette vending machines. In Scotland, there was a ban on uh, drink discounts, basically two for one offers and wine and so on in Scotland. Um, and in Denmark, they saw the start of a fat tax uh, to increase the price of food that the medical establishment considered to be in some way suspect. Um, are these three events on the same day linked? Yes, I think they are. I think they're very much linked. I think they're all on a, on in this, going in the same direction at different speeds with um, the anti-obesity crowd and the temperance lobby following very much in the footsteps of, um, of the anti-smoking lobby. And for years, there have been people coming to events like this from you know, the Freedom Association, the Adam Smith Institute, or Forrest, and what have you, warning that whatever treatment is dished out to smokers will in due course be dished out to everybody else, and particularly to people who, who like a drink, or people who, who like to eat fatty foods or, or sugary drinks, and saying that um, the, 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 the ramifications were for everybody. And by and large, these people have been ignored. Uh, they've been accused of being hysterical libertarians um, and falling for the slippery slope fallacy. And, um, and we're told basically that the cigarette is a unique danger. Uh, you know, it's, it's the only product that can kill when used as the manufacturer directed. And this was a unique danger and it was being treated in a unique way of stigmatization, and banning advertisements and putting warnings on it and increasing the tax and so on. And they said this would not go on to, to anybody else and this was just fear mongering. Um, by, by libertarians and people who have vested interests and so on. Well, guess what? In, in late 2011, we have enough evidence now, I think, under our belts to see that the hysterical libertarians were right and um, the drinkers and the salad dodgers were wrong. And we, um, we've seen that there really is nothing fallacious about this particular slippery slope. It's become absolutely clear, I think, that the anti-smoking crusade has set a template which has been copied to every detail by the temperance lobby and the, the, the anti-fast food lobby and, and various others. And so at this stage, October 2011, the agenda of the so-called public health campaign is for things like this. Think, uh, graphic photos of diseased livers on drink bottles, a syntax on fizzy drinks, a minimum price on alcohol, which presumably will just go up and up and up if drinking fails to go down and down and down. Uh, a ban on all alcohol advertising and marketing, a ban on all so-called junk food marketing, um, a fat tax, a pub tax, a ban on drinking games in pubs, a ban on bar crawls, a free drink maximum in, in pubs, banning alcohol sales in supermarkets, warning labels on all foods uh, that have been designated unhealthy. I'm not making any of these up. All of these things have been seriously proposed by senior people within the public health move movement. Uh, many of them are unshapeled planks in the agenda um, of the public health crusaders for the next few years ahead. And why, why shouldn't they be? Um, on, on a basic, a simple principle, there is no reason at all to treat fast food um, or pizzas or vodka and Red Bull differently to a pack of cigarettes. Um, there's no doubt at all that alcohol is linked to liver diseases. There's no doubt really that obesity is linked also to, to several serious diseases. Um, there's reasonable evidence that certain diets increase the risk uh, of various cancers. Smoking, admittedly, is, is a larger risk than any of those things, but that really is just a, a question of degrees. Um, in, in, as far as public health is concerned, these are all carcinogens, and they need to be dealt with in carcinogens, uh, as carcinogens, just as they've dealt with um, tobacco. Now, some of you might think that, you know, the policies that I've, I've read out are a perfectly reasonable response to, to uh, serious uh, health problems, in which case it's unlikely that we'll ever see eye to eye. Um, but many of you may not see that as being um, you know, the future that you want to see. And I've been to this conference before, and I see some faces I know, and so I know there are a lot of binge drinkers here. 
And, <laughs> and I know that some of you probably consume more calories and more alcohol units than the government uh, thinks is, is right for you. And you might rightly say that whatever you choose to do, if you, if you want to take these, these certain risks with your life, it's your own life and it's nobody else's business. And I would agree with you, because I put those words in your mouth, really, but I would, say, <laughs> would, would agree with that sentiment very much so. Um, but it's, it's inconsistent to, to, to defend one and, and, and not defend the other. The, the right to self-ownership, the right to, to do what you want with your own body, is the most fundamental of rights, I think. So we have a choice. We can either live in a society where special interest groups decide uh, how much a product costs, what it, what it, how it's packaged, where you can buy it, or we can live in something approaching a free market. And we can live in a society where the same special interest groups bully us and penalise us and extort money from us if we fail to um, live in the way that politically active doctors think we should live, or we can live in a, in a free society. What I think is absolutely clear is that we cannot pick and choose any longer the freedoms that we, we wish to defend. If you're going to concede that the state has a right, in the, in the case of smokers, um, not just a right but a duty, to cajole people into living in a way that the British Medical Association would approve of, then you've opened a Pandora's box which, which cannot be easily closed. Um, and I, I don't think, frankly, that, that, it, that it can be closed now. Um, I'm very pessimistic about it. I think the time for challenges was probably 20 or 30 years ago. We now have um, a vast network of, um, of powerful, um, unelected, unsackable people working who are almost like a third force in, in government. And then they remain there no matter who wins the election, no matter which party's in charge. They're always there um, with a hugely disproportionate um, influence over politicians and this halo of, of, of health over their head. Uh, and these people are not just lobbying the state, they are, in, in, a, in a real sense, the state itself. And within this group, within the public health movement, there is no longer any serious debate um, about what needs to be done. Quite simply, alcohol and tobacco need to move towards being controlled drugs. And certain foods should be, well, all foods should be, should be regulated as tightly as possible. And some foods, if possible, like trans fat, should be banned. So long as public opinion allows, and public opinion generally does allow, because of the, 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 the weight of propaganda against against these um, these products. Um, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, you can go to even the most liberal public health conference, and you will hear these these sentiments expressed. It's taken as read that longevity is the ultimate goal of, of human civilization. Um, they would not recognize, um, let alone sympathize, with the view that it might be better to have a happy, unrestrained life until the age of 75 than to have a miserable life for self-denial to the age of 85. It just it, it would not even occur to them. And this is their mentality, and by association, it is effectively the, the, um, the mentality of the state. And that, I think, is what separates the individual from the state in this. Because the individual, all of you, when you're out tonight or whenever, will be balancing potential risk against pleasure and you'll be living in the here and now and doing things that you you want to do and what makes you happy and they might not be the most sensible decisions or they may, or they may well be the most sensible decisions but only you can decide that uh, and only you make the choice between possible health come, out outcomes later down the line and pleasure in the here and now and the state is increasingly determined to deny you that choice um, and that's a big difference and um, the state effectively thinks that we need protecting from ourselves, and I think, and it's not an, a new thought, I realise, but I think that we need protecting from the state. Um, and although that's uh, a familiar idea, it is the conclusion of what I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, thank you very much um, for that. And um, it's, I mean, it's been quite a strange position being the last person to speak, having heard uh, arguments against the regulation of tobacco, fatty foods, but also arguments about anti-terrorist laws, CCTV, and automatic number plate recognition. So I will try and cover at least some of those points in, in the limited time I do have. But uh, just a quick sort of public service disclaimer. Um, I am the former director of Big Brother Watch. I now work for Bell Pottinger, and the views I'm going to express today are entirely my own views. Um, anyway, Tom introduced me. My name is Daniel Hamilton. Um, I am overweight. Um, and that is largely because of the amount of uh, food I eat, the amount of booze I consume. 
I don't smoke because I don't want to smoke. Um, tonight, it is very likely that I will drink up to 10 pints. Um, I've got a dinner at 7.30 this evening. Um, I might possibly, if time allows later, head to Curry Mile for a second dinner at about midnight. Um, now, all of these actions are things that make me overweight. Um, and if I want to lose weight, it's a very easy process to go through. Uh, I stop doing that. I drink water instead of bitter. Uh, I eat salad instead of uh, merg masala. Um, and I generally take a more healthy attitude to, to the way I live my life. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, we're in a situation in this country, and despite the, uh, some of the more gloomy reports that we get from uh, the likes of my friend here, Tom Clockerty, at the Adam Smith Institute about uh, the way in which our lives are increasingly regulated, we do at least uh, just about still live in a free society in the UK where people can make decisions about what food they eat and what they do. And consumption, it always strikes me, is, is choice. Um, these are decisions we make. The decision I make to drink is a decision I make and a decision the government simply shouldn't be involved in. But uh, let me just address a couple of very quick points about smoking. Um, as Philip Davis said earlier, um, I do not like smoking. I think smoking is um, something I don't want to be around. I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the way it makes my clothes smell in the morning. And it's something I don't particularly want to be around. But, uh, but what it does strike me as a non-smoker is the fact that my, my decision to, to avoid smoke, my decision not to allow people to smoke in my house, a decision that I've made, it's a decision that I take, and I kindly ask people who do visit my home not to smoke inside. Um, but it also strikes me that business owners, people who choose to open a pub, and let's not forget a pub is a public house, it is a business they choose to open, should be allowed to decide on their own premises what goes on. Now, as a non-smoker, I used to make the decision to go into a bar, bar that allowed smoking. There was a you know, very clearly sign on there saying this is a smoking pub. I was to walk in there and I actually smell smoke and I made the decision to stay in there. And that struck me always as a very, very fair thing. No one was forcing me to be in there. I was deciding to hand my money to that barman in exchange for drinks in a smoky atmosphere. Um, and it strikes me that it should really be logical that if a sign is on the door saying this is a smoking pub, if you don't want to be around smoke, do not go into said pub. Now, perhaps I'm taking too logical a view on this, but I simply think it's not the government's role, it's not the government's responsibility to tell us that, you know, in certain cases, we can't conduct perfectly legal activities. If the government does want to crack down on smoking, if the anti-smoking lobby, and it is their ultimate uh, objective, do want to ban smoking, let them be honest about it. Let them actually say, we want to make this stuff illegal, rather than nudging us day by day, hour by hour, into more and more controlled behaviour, and more and more micro-regulation of our, of our private, uh, private habits. And, Smoking's not a sexy issue. It's, uh, e even people like me who uh, you know, do advocate the rights of smokers say it's not something we like, but it is something that is at the front line of, of arguments about personal liberty. And it's some arguments about the way in which we can, we can choose to live our life from, from a sort of sin perspective. Um, we've seen the increasing regulation of smoking over the last few years. We've seen the ban now in pubs on cigarettes even being sold from vending machines. But we also see spectacles like the particularly odious character of Cathy Jameson, a member of the Scottish Parliament, who wants to ban Buckfast tonic on the grounds that it is uh, something which causes antisocial behaviour in our communities, apparently. Um, the real agenda of a lot of these people is actually to crack down on the consumption of all forms of alcohol, of all forms of tobacco, of all forms of fatty food. Um, so let's not think of tobacco, even though it's not a, not, a, not a sexy issue, as something we shouldn't take seriously. It is at the front line of every single piece of micro-regulation, of our private life, and of our private habits. Now, I know it's appreciated, it's, it's a very strange thing to move to, move to the other argument, but uh, obviously I've addressed a few of these sort of sin issues, and I've addressed my position on them, so let me just respond very quickly to a couple of the points that, that Philip Davis made. Um, I'm a Conservative, um, and I do take a hard-line approach to law and order. I want to see some of the vicious and wicked scum on our streets who take part in antisocial behaviour, who mug old ladies, who do all sorts of terrible things like take part in the London riots. I want to see them in prison. I want to see them crack down on in the most extreme of ways. But I simply don't believe that any of the arguments that we've seen uh, over the last few weeks about CCTV are things that actually prove it's an effective technology. Now, in the UK, and let me just offer you one statistic which shows the proliferation of CCTV cameras in this country and the national obsession we have for them. There are more CCTV cameras on the Orkney and Shetland Islands than there are in the entire San Francisco Police Department. Now, in the UK, CCTV and something that local councils spend £321 million on a year, and each of those CCTV cameras, the tens of thousands that we have, for every thousand cameras, only one crime is solved each year. 
Now, at Big Brother Watch, we conducted a piece of research uh, towards the end of end of last year on the amount that CCTV actually costs. Now, I've mentioned the example of £321 million. Pounds. That obviously doesn't factor in many of the authorities who, for you know, very convenient reasons for them, failed to respond to our Freedom of Information request. Uh, th those figures alone, £321 million, pounds, would have provided more than 5,500 more police officers on the streets up and down the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. Now, when it comes to the London riots, uh, CCTV, of course, has been effective in bringing some of these people to justice in terms of catching some of these criminals and finding out exactly who they are. But the most important thing about crime fighting isn't solving crime. The police aren't there to simply solve crime, they're also there to prevent crime, and that's a far more important thing. How, I'd much rather the money we use for CCTV uh, is actually diverted to frontline policing. And unfortunately, when we are facing budget cuts, when we are facing difficult decisions that have to be made in that respect, uh, yeah, decisions have to be made. And unfortunately, too many councils and too many police forces are opting for CCTV rather than bobbies on the beat. Um, and I'd leave you with that you know, very quick question. What would you rather see, police actively on the streets or CCTV cameras, which have been statistically proven time and time again not to actually cut down on crime? Um, and just one last, one last point. Um, obviously, Philip mentioned the idea of the national DNA database. Uh, only 0.3% of crimes in this country are actually solved by the DNA database. It is something that people put far too much reliance on. But it's also something that details of 1.1 million innocent people are held on. These are people who haven't been convicted of any crime. These are people who've never actually committed a crime in their lives. But their details are held alongside those of common criminals. Now, obviously, there is the Philip Davis argument, which is an intellectually, intellectually solid one. He says, put every single person on that database. Make every single member of, you know, member of society in the UK come forward, give across their, their, their DNA. And that is an intellectually solid argument, but I'd like to see anyone who does belong to that fundamentalist wing of DNA, uh, but belief in the National DNA Database, to make that argument. H how are they going to collect these samples? Are, all, are we all going to be marched uh, you know, for fear of prosecution, for fear of being fined, to hand over our DNA to some faceless bureaucrat? Uh, if the answer is yes, then uh, you know, I'd, 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 I'd appreciate that and I'd accept the position. I'd respectfully disagree with it, but it strikes me that those people who are from the fundamentalist wing when it comes to the National DNA Database simply haven't thought through the way it's going to be used and have also thought through some of the extremely serious implications it has for personal privacy and civil liberties in the UK. Now, I appreciate the comments I made have been sort of reasonably wide-ranging from cigarettes to the National DNA Database, but I hope that is at least some part of the contribution to this debate. I look forward to taking any questions with the remainder of the panel. Thank you.